Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner and I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I will be with you today to kind of help filter questions, help get us on, it's somewhat on track to stay in a half an hour or 35 minutes is what we really like to say when we go over this amazingly awesome topic of the 14th Amendment. So today we're gonna to be looking closely at the 14th Amendment from the reconstruction time period. So right after the Civil War, all the way through to some more modern court cases. And thank goodness I am not alone doing this today. <laughs> and Scott is really happy that he's not stuck with me. That was our theory. If you didn't show up, Scott and I, we were gonna do it. So we are here with Nicholas Mosquez, who is our Senior Fellow of Constitutional Studies. Nick is excited to get into this. So Nicholas, I thought we'd start off in your favorite place in talking about American history, the reconstruction time period. So you can kind of set the foundation for us. When is the 14th Amendment added? What was it added with? And then we'll dive into like the word. Sound good? Wait, did, did I pause or did you pause? I think I paused. Okay, it's, okay. It's I'm over you. Sure. Reconstruction. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So we're, we're just starting with the text here before I get into the, the litany of causes. Well, um, almost like <laughs> lay down how these three amendments are added really quickly together and then we'll go into the text. <laughs> well, this will remind everyone the there's a civil war and that's that's really my my piece, my period. Um, and that's pretty important, right? Because one of the products of the civil war is the the abolishing of slavery because the 13th amendment is in fact passed uh, by Congress in January 1865, but it's ratified in December 1865. And um, the Southern states in the Confederacy, one of the things that they have to agree to to return is to ratify this 13th Amendment. So that's a product of that Civil War. We'll get into that a little bit more, I think, with the 14th and 15th Amendments, kind of specifically what experiences went into the text. But broadly speaking, what is the 14th Amendment doing? It's um, giving a promise and a guarantee of basic rights and equality to all, and it's putting that into a constitutional guarantee. They, we'll get into the other places that it had been before, but this is now constitutionalizing that and giving Congress power to, um, to do something about that, which we'll also talk about because one of the real big questions from the beginning to now is just how much power was Congress given by Section 5 of the 14th Amendment um, to recognize and protect these various freedoms and guarantees of equality. And then the 15th Amendment, that's, so that was 1866 when it was passed, ratified 1868. 15th Amendment is passed by Congress in February 1869, ratified a year later. Um, and as we put here, right, it bans racial discrimination voting. We can talk if we, for a moment about the differences between the two, that question came up this moment, which is to say the language that we get is language that says that states and the federal government cannot discriminate on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So that means no racial discrimination in voting, but there's no guarantee of a right to vote. We've talked about that in other classes. There were efforts to broaden that language or to even apply it to women as, as, as well as African-Americans um, and to try to plan poll taxes and illiteracy exams. But as Curry knows, we just talked about this last time, we can do a whole class on this and maybe we should so that <laughs> we can better get into the specific history of um, the 15th Amendment itself. Um, so that's those three amendments. And I, we really need to look at them as a whole as we dive into the 14th. And that's why we wanted to kind of give you that framing reference. And so let's dive into the 14th because, and you'll see all my colorful words, um, yes. but it's, this is what I love about looking at the 14th amendment. First of all, it's like a smorgasbord. It's a tire buffet of amazing pieces. And we can pull them out and ask questions about what does this mean? What does this idea mean? And we're going to break them down into those four concepts that we shared earlier, but Nick, kind of walk us through this, at least section one, and what's the big ideas that come out of here? Yeah, well, as, as you preview, there's a lot, right? And so we have to kind of start uh, with the first part, right? We have to bake, break this down section by section, right? So we start with that first piece of language, the citizenship clause. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof 
that is under the laws of the United States and within the jurisdiction. So that could mean both the territory of the United States and, say, a military base, for instance, today, right? Because those are subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, are citizens of the United States and the states wherein they reside. The purpose of this is to overrule the Dred Scott case, which I know Curry can go back and show you Dred and Harriet Scott. We talked about that last week. Um, the big piece of the Dred Scott case is that um, uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney and the majority of the court, remember there are two dissenters, said that the Scots could not be citizens of the United States under the Constitution and therefore could not sue in federal court, right? So that was the next step. They weren't citizens, therefore they can't sue. So section one here, it's following efforts that the Republicans that had already engaged with because they already believed that African-Americans could be and were citizens of the United States. During the Civil War, I mentioned this at the noon hour, um, Lincoln's own Attorney General Edward Bates wrote a 30-page uh, opinion saying Dred Scott was wrong. Uh, African-Americans can be citizens. The uh, Citizen Civil Rights Act of 1866 recognized this too. But of course, both those things could be overruled, right? They could be overturned by a new administration, a new Congress. So the point of putting this into the Constitution permanently, right? These ideas, they've had them for some time. They've started acting on them, but now it's in the Constitution, right? It's, it's See how that's being applied here. Um, we talk about this as birthright citizenship. I know I mentioned this at noon. There is a minority, both at the time and now, who read that citizenship clause differently to, to not grant this full birthright citizenship. But generally, the uh, consensus position is that what Section 1 is doing is guaranteeing this concept of birthright citizenship, which I know Curry is going to get us to Wong Kim Mark in a second. We'll talk about that. So what's after that? Privileges or immunities, right? No state shall make or enforce any law. So remember, that's states, right? It's applying to the states now. Uh, any law which will abridge uh, the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. The key here, right, is uh, we actually had this language before in Article Two, um, Article 4 of the original Constitution, right, which guaranteed the privileges and immunities of citizens. The idea there was to guarantee some basic rights of all citizens when they move between the states, right? And what the anti-slavery constitutionalists thought for decades was this should protect freemen throughout the country, right? Is that if you're the Scots and you go back to Missouri, you should still be free. You should still have basic guarantees of equality under the law, right? In other words, they thought this before, right? And so that language is reflecting that belief that the constitution was supposed to do this. We got this wrong. We are now making sure that states must recognize some basic freedoms and liberties in every state to all people, right? So you, I'm just trying to give that sense, right? Yeah, see what no. they're trying to do, right? Absolutely. That language and is trying to do something that they thought should have been done before, that applied before, but we screwed it up. The courts screwed it up. We're going, Now we're writing it in that permanently to make clear that, yes, that's a basic guarantee to all, right? Absolutely. That there's a way like to double down on it in the 14th yes. Amendment and say, there are privileges and immunities if you're a citizen and no matter where you go, they are yours. Right. And we'll get later into incorporation, but that's like so important to think about rights and freedoms that are yours no matter where you go, not the state's or not the governments, that the individuals. And, and what um, did you say immunities earlier on noon? Yeah, the way, I like well, to use immunities very scientifically. Like, oh, right, it's right. like you have an immunity, you're right. getting inoculated almost. And so you have an immunity that protects you. And that means the constitution is yours and it's your protection as well. So it's like, it is like the vaccination for the constitution is yours and it doesn't wear off. Some vaccines do. Uh, it's the only like caveat there. So, and so the, the next piece there, right? Is yeah, and due process, Matthew, right? Yeah, as you go into due process and look at these words, uh, Matthew's class asks, is the 14th amendment, is that the first place we see life, liberty and property in the constitution? Right, so it's a good question because yeah. again, just like privileges or immunities, which by the way, the the real tricky thing is it's privileges and immunities in the original and privileges or immunities 14th. What's the difference? It's not clear that there is really a difference. Well, it's the same question here is this is basically the fifth amendment, but now in the 14th amendment, and now it says 
nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. Well, the whole thing had been the Fifth Amendment didn't apply to the states according to the Supreme Court in an 1833 case called Barron versus Baltimore, which was based on the Fifth Amendment of a suit. And the, and the uh, Supreme Court said, no, the Fifth Amendment doesn't apply to the states. The implication there was the Bill of Rights don't apply to the states generally. So here, it's applying the due process, that same language, which is taken from the Magna Carta, by the way, right? It's old language, just applying it to the states, right? Um, we'll get into what due process means because that actually has real significance for the 20th and 21st century. And then finally, um, which so by the way, that's a good question because yes, that's the whole thing here, right? Is they're taking old ideas and language and they're trying to apply it further basically and say, no, 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 that should do more. We thought it did more, it should do more. Uh, Nor should any state deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, if you're thinking you just explain privileges or immunities and due process, what else does that do? So what does equal protection mean? You're asking the right questions, right? There's a lot here. And that's exactly the debates they're having from this point forward, right? Is we're trying to figure out what do all these things do? What rights are they protecting? Um, How much has changed? Those are all the real big questions that come out of this, right? There's a lot here. How much is different? How much is new? What rights are we talking about? And I just put the Fifth Amendment in the chat. Oh, and yes, the, thank you, you. So everybody could see that spot that is real clear that says life, liberty, and property. So you can see kind of that yep. reference point because it isn't, it's this idea of due process and life, liberty, and property. So I love that you said that, Nick, because it makes me think like, so they write it down and then, and people like Bingham, and we'll talk about him in a minute, are speaking about it. But it's really where we get the understanding of what it means and where the boundaries are, are through the courts. So when we think about these like big ideas that come out of the 14th Amendment, birthright citizenship, protection of equality, protection of freedom, and Congress has more power, at least for the first three big ideas, we see this, that push in the courts. And we're gonna start kind of tick through these pretty quickly, but we'll start with birth rate citizenship. We talked a little bit about Dred and Harry Scott, but do you wanna to go to kind of the case that really defines this or when it go one, two? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think Juan Kim Ark is worth getting to and for, for two reasons, right? So we talked a little bit about uh, Dred Scott and reversing that decision, which was such a fundamental goal for the Republicans, right? Because they believed uh, Lincoln on down, right, immediately that uh, this decision was absolutely wrong, right, that um, it didn't make sense historically, it didn't make sense textually, it must be reversed, right, and as I suggested, during the Civil War, they acted like it was wrong. I know Tom Donnelly, our other fellow, brought this up last week when he said that Congress banned um, slavery in uh, Washington, D.C. in 1862, That was essentially saying, no, Dred Scott is wrong, right? So they definitely believed that. They just needed to put this into the Constitution permanently, right? But then it brought about other questions during the debates in Congress. And the big questions were, okay, so this idea, does this apply to Native Americans? Does this apply to the children of foreign ambassadors? And does this apply to Chinese laborers? The representatives out West, you know, from California, from Oregon, from these, these new states, they were very concerned that this would apply to Chinese laborers. Well, you would see very quickly the rise of the Chinese Exclusion Acts in the 1880s, um, specifically efforts in, in California to discriminate at the state level um, that brought us to that Juan Kim R case. And we're gonna get to Plessy in a moment, but I said this at noon, I think this is true. It's amazing that in 1898, that same court is um, putting birthright citizenship, right? They're, um, uh, they're interpreting it, right? They're, they're saying that, yes, this is what the citizenship clause meant was to guarantee birthright citizenship for all those born in the United States, um, including uh, Wang Kim Ark, who's the children of uh, Chinese immigrants and laborers. Um, so, uh, and, and the thing about that case, which is, is well worth reading, um, is, you know, it's a very long discussion uh, going back to English history and English common law 
of what this idea of birthright citizenship is and why it should apply and what the framers meant. That is the framers of the 14th Amendment, what they were trying to do. But the Supreme Court confirms this. And I mentioned this at noon, and I think this is true, which is that we have what they write in 1866. We have those debates. But then the Supreme Court in 1898 is really kind of settling that in many respects going forward, because even if it's debated now, we everyone can point to this case that's now 123 years old. And that remains kind of the big statement of principle for what the citizenship clause was meant. And it's about the rights of the child of Chinese laborers who were really the main target in that period um, for Chinese exclusion act. Yeah, for discrimination from citizenship. And you can see the clip. That's why I picked this paper clipping to mm-hmm. show, like, look at it, look at the other questions they're asking around there. Can can Chinese vote? Like, what what are all these things that come with citizenship that they are debating and saying, here's the here's the questions. Warren asked, and then we'll jump to, I know we have a lot to get through today, but I really think Warren's question is where we hear a lot of modern debate today. So what if somebody sneaks into the country to have their baby, should the child be considered a citizen? Where, where does that fall today? Yeah, I mean, it's, that certainly gets into, right. into the like, questions, go, right? But um, yeah, I mean, under the principle, the answer is still that yes, even if somebody is here illegally and they, but they have the child under the jurisdiction of the United States, then the child is a citizen, but the parents are not. Yep. So in other words, what it's, it's, it's only answering the question about the, the citizenship child. of the child. Um, and so that's, that's why it's a hard question. It was a hard question then, because of course, the first thing they're trying to resolve is a question that exists, which is what about the African-Americans here that are both free and formerly mm-hmm. enslaved? Um, because they didn't just come here, right? Absolutely. Um, so it's answering that question first. And that's why the debate was, okay, so how far does this principle apply? Um, but the Supreme Court resolved that in 1898. That's, you know, that's what I'm getting at as well. Okay, but he was the child of immigrants and he was born here. And even if we didn't consider his parents citizens, um, their child is. Got it. So next big kind of big idea or feature, I love that, um, protection of equality. So I thought we would start with a little bit of Bingham and like what was Bingham's understanding and discussions around this while writing the 14th and after, and then dive into some like some one, two, three, four court cases looking at equality. And, and then the next one, it rolls into freedom really nicely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and we got a little bit to some of Bingham's ideas before, right. Is to say, like, think of John Bingham, you know, he's the, he's the framer. I, by which say he's the main drafter of the 14th amendment. He's a Senator from Ohio. Um, he's certainly taking these ideas I mentioned that are decades old from anti-slavery constitutionalism. You know, he's, he's part of that discussion. Uh, Bingham already believes that, um, the bill of rights apply to the States. You know, he believes that there already should have been this robust protection of quality, but he's trying to right a wrong essentially. Right. So he thinks that's what he's doing in the language he's writing is applying these basic guarantees to everyone throughout the country. Um, and we can get to the incorporation question, but Bingham himself seems to believe that his language incorporates the Bill of Rights to apply it in the States, but there's dispute about that. Um, and Bingham, I think we, I like how we put this earlier today, which is think of Bingham like James Madison, who writes mm-hmm. uh, the Bill of Rights and has a big role in the Constitution. Well, he's immediately a member of Congress debating the meaning of the things he wrote years later. Bingham's doing the same thing, right? As he, it's, you know, 1870, 1871, 1872, when they're in Congress debating, use the Section 5, right? Um, how Congress is going to uh, um, act to protect those 14th Amendment rights. Talking about the Enforcement Acts, the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. Bingham there is starting to say more and more, no, what I meant was to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. No, what I meant was to get to private acts as well as public acts. I didn't mean just state action. So Bingham is in there on the halls of Congress responding to uh, more conser- um, other voices who are not, uh, who are maybe considered moderate or conservative who are saying, I don't know if we went that far. The whole, that's the point is Bingham's part of that conversation, right? Which takes us to the Supreme Court, right? 
Exactly. I'm gonna say, so, so right after that, right? And he like he's so he's the framer. So we look yes. at Madison's notes and we look at what he writes leading up to the Constitution, during the Constitution, and after. Yes. And yet the court isn't looking at the uh, the notes of Bingham when deciding Plessy, correct? Well, right. Or is we you know we start with Slaughterhouse to just get oh, yeah, there's exactly. a quick road there, right? But no, I mean, they're we not. Need right? in this class. <laughs> no, they're not looking to just uh, to to Senator Bingham, right? I mean, in the 20th, 21st century, we started thinking about that more. Um, but the justices on the Supreme Court, no, not really. Um, and um, a lot of them are Republicans, right? They were put on the court by Republican presidents. But fundamentally, what they're trying to answer is that question of how much the 14th Amendment changed the constitutional system. And mostly what they mean is federalism, right? That division of power between state and federal government. In the sense that, well, the framers of the 14th Amendment, did they really mean to take away that much state police power? And remember, when we say police power, we mean the state regulatory, broad regulatory authority over public health, safety, and morals, right? This old power that they had. And so the Supreme Court, a lot of the justices had the sense that, well, it couldn't have me meant to change that much, right? So in the slaughterhouse cases, you don't have to get into the specific facts. It's just what they say is the privileges or immunities, all it meant was to protect these um, guarantees of national citizenship that are in the Constitution. So the right to protection on the high seas is one of the examples, right? In other words, what Justice Miller was saying was it's not those rights of you know, contract and property and to defend yourself and, uh, you know, those things, right? It's, no, it's not fundamental liberties. It's just the things in the Constitution um, that are related to national citizenship. And that it was, the 14th Amendment was only about protecting against discrimination against African-Americans. It wasn't about anything more, which the dissenters thought it was, right? In other words, the dissenters in Slaughterhouse were saying, no, this is about some fundamental guarantees of liberty against the states. That's what was going on here. I, I always point to Justice Noah Swain, who was a Lincoln appointee, and Swain said, it doesn't matter what we think. Congress said they were making a big change, and they did so, and the people ratified it. Therefore, the question has been answered. That's what Swain said, right? And that sets up the dispute going forward. So that's Slaughterhouse. We get Cruikshank, which you know, is a very important case too. Just a couple of years later, that comes out of the Koufax massacre. And I think we said that's roughly 100, 150 uh, African-Americans who are killed in Louisiana. It comes out of a political dispute, right? This is political violence between a uh, white mob and African-Americans. And um, the instigators, the leaders are arrested by federal officials. Right, and they're charged with violating constitutional rights. The First um, Amendment right to assemble, right, freedom of assembly. The Second Amendment right to self-defense. Uh, the Fifth Amendment property rights and due process rights. And then the Fourteenth Amendment equal protection clause. And the Supreme Court says, well, the Bill of Rights doesn't apply because they don't apply against the state. So you can throw those three pieces out. And the 14th Amendment doesn't apply because the state didn't act here. It was private actors is what they say, right? This is one of the first examples of what we call the state action doctrine. This notion that the state had to act for the 14th Amendment to apply, that that fifth uh, section five was just remedial. In other words, it was a remedy against state action and discrimination, but not anything further, which is why in the Civil Rights Act uh, cases of 1883, the court with one dissenter overturned the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which was trying to uh, deal with discrimination in public accommodations, including private acts, right? You can see why this is very important. Mm -hmm. And that takes us all the way to Plessy, right? Who is that one dissenter? That's Justice John Marshall Harlan. We're gonna get to him in a second. But what is the majority- only have six minutes, so I know, and the, what does the majority <laughs> say here, right? What is going on in Plessy, right? Plessy is about states acting again, right? They're saying under our police powers, we can regulate the, the, the safety, health, and morals of our society. And that includes um, passing these Jim Crow laws. And they say it's equal combination, right? The, uh, there's a black car, there's a white car, um, and both races have an interest in being separated. That's what the state claims. Um, Homer Plessy and the association he's 
Parnov, they file suit under the 13th and 14th Amendment. He's arrested on purpose in order to challenge the constitutionality of this act and to say this isn't about equal combination. It's about discrimination. The Supreme Court says, well, no, it's, um, you know, this is just the police power. The states always had this power. Um, they, Justice Brown, who's from Massachusetts, says that the object of the 14th Amendment was to enforce the equality of the two races before the law. But it wasn't about abolishing distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as opposed to political equality, right? Um, so, so you're saying you, they're basically saying, well, we're not going to change society. We're saying right. that the law has to be fair and equal, yes. but society yes, can do this as long as it's they're, equal. Exactly. That, they're making a distinction, right? And saying yeah. it didn't change that much. And Brown comes from an anti-slavery family, and he, but he thinks that that goes too far. Well, Justice Harlan, who um, he's from a slaveholding family in Kentucky, and he's a Democrat before and during the Civil War, and he opposes the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. But he has a change of heart and mind in the 1870s before he gets on the Supreme Court. And he becomes convinced otherwise that the purpose of these amendments is to do something far more, right? And so, like I said, he's the dissenter in the civil rights cases. Uh, he famously uses Justice Taney's pen to write his dissent. And in Plessy, he says two things, right? One, he says, um, this is pretextual. And what we mean by that is, uh, this is discrimination. The, the state is acting on the pretext that this, this is about equal accommodation. And Harlan says, no, we all know it's not that. The, the purpose of the Separate Cars Act is to, uh, to discriminate against African Americans by separating them from the white people on the train. And that's the only purpose of this act, right? It's discriminatory. And we know that. It's just under what he calls the guise of equal combination, right? That's a great term. And he's saying it's it's a lie, as Curry put it earlier. Yeah, like one thing we're all really transparent, because we ask ourselves all the time, do you, like, did they know that? Like, in hindsight, maybe we have more information. And when you read the dissent, oh, yeah, they know that, it. And he's and like- And that's why Harlan's so powerful, right? It's because- yeah. He's calling in 1896, it like it is. yes, he's saying, no, we know what this is about. You're just kidding yourself. You're fooling yourself if you think otherwise. And he says very famously at the end of his dissent, he says two things. One, he says, in the eye of the law, in this country, there's no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There's no caste here. He's right. The thing, we can't create a caste system, right? The Constitution doesn't do that. And we as the court should never do that because the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens, right? He says that's what the equal protection clause is doing, right? Is guaranteeing uh, all citizens are equal before the law. And then finally, he says, my judgment is this day, this case, one time, proved to be quite as pernicious as the decision made by this court in the Dred Scott case, right? He says it right then and there. You don't understand how this case is going to look, right? Yeah. This is going to be one of the worst cases and decisions ever handed by the Illinois court. And he's right. It just takes 58 years for the Supreme Court to recognize the mistake they made. Um, and then, and Nick, I know we have to, we have a couple of students that have to jump in a minute and they want to get to our burger Can you walk us through the, the through line from equality to freedom when we're looking at these big ideas from the, that 50 years later, looking yes. at Brown versus Board of Ed, then Loving v. Virginia, then our burger and kind of connect the dots for us real quick? Yeah. And I think the big thing we like to say about Brown, and I think it's important, which is, um, to realize that the fight didn't stop, right? Yes, the Supreme Court handed down this decision, but within 10 years, you had the Niagara Falls movement and you had the creation of the NAACP. And with it, by the 1910s, you had a legal strategy beginning to fight and chip away at Jim Crow. And by the 1930s, Charles Hamilton Houston, um, and then his, um, his uh, mentee, Thorogood Marshall started the work of really the strategy of piece by piece taking apart Jim Crow, right? Things like guaranteeing Sixth Amendment rights to Black criminal defendants, right? And then moving into education and saying uh, no discrimination at the law school level, no discrimination in colleges, right? It's piece by piece, public seg uh, housing segregation, things like that, right? 
And, then- and that gets us all to this one last piece, right? The big issue, which is public schooling everywhere, right? Not just about law schools or colleges. Now this is Northern and Southern states, right? This is segregation in public schools is, it's pretty broad, right? And it's old. And this is a nine to nothing decision, right? This is a unanimous decision. I think it's crucial because the court is trying to make this big statement, right? Because it's a short decision. And Chief Justice Warren wants it to be that. He wants it to be like John Marshall's court in the sense that we have some disagreements amongst us, but we're going to put out this big unanimous decision that has these big principles everyone can read and understand. And so it says, Plessy versus Ferguson is overruled, 14th Amendment violation by doing this. And then they cite this research to show um, that separate by equal was always a a fallacy, right? It was false because the mental and physical effects of the discrimination in public schooling upon black students, right? Or just in segregation overall. Exactly, exactly. It's to say like, no, 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 this has real effects. And we should recognize that and let us, and sh- that can inform us that this was an equal protection violation, right? And so that's what the court was trying to do there. Um, loving comes under due process and equal protection. So it's, both things are doing work here. I mentioned early on due process, having this, what we call a substantive component. Um, the notion that due process doesn't just protect procedural rights, but fundamental rights of liberty um, that the government cannot violate either the state or the federal government. And then the court has to determine what those are. And generally they do so by looking at kind of history and then uh, you know, kind of broader conventions. And that starts with property rights and economic rights, right? We consider this the Lochner, uh, kind of the Lochner idea, but then it changes over time. And loving is, looking kind of back instead to this uh, Meyer versus Nebraska, this education case from the 1920s. But the point there is that they, the court said fundamental liberty is the right to educate your own children, right? That that's a fundamental right. Well, so the Supreme Court in 1967 is saying, okay, but the right to marry is also fundamental mm-hmm. to people's lives, right? Essentially that it's a, it's a fundamental right to choose the person you love and to marry. Um, and it's, it's attacking these anti-miscegenation laws that have been around since the 1830s and 1840s, right? These are very old laws banning interracial marriage that were, again, both in the South and the North because there um, was fear both before and after the Civil War of the the rise of interracial marriage is a threat to society that states could ban if they wanted to, right? Again, that was a police powers notion that, well, states had always had the right to determine um, things like marriage rights. And therefore they have to be the ones to change that. 1967, the court moves away from that notion towards the idea that no, this is a fundamental right that is protected both by due process, equal protection. And the lead up to 2015 to Obergefell is the application to the principle to a different set of circumstances. I know Curry and I talked about this earlier today. so. Uh, to answer the question of why didn't loving just apply broadly? Well, because it's dealing with a history of anti-miscegenation uh, laws that are about banning interracial marriage. And uh, the definition of marriage between man and woman has to do instead of a different kind of discrimination and a different set of laws, or at least that the argument, right? And I, and I say that to recognize that this notion of what is a fundamental liberty and right and how it applies remains a point of contestation, right? In other words, it's not settled. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the court here has applied this to state laws that not only restricted marriage rights on the basis uh, that they should be between men and women, but then the subsequent um, uh, legal protection and rights that came with them, specifically in this instance, um, uh, rights after a loved one dies, right? Uh, estate rights, things like that, right? Ability to sign papers, yeah. um, things, of, uh, things of that, right? So it's, it's a separate set of circumstances um, that we, so it's 
the principle think, is there, but yeah. then the circumstances are different. Well, I think what is so interesting when looking at these two cases is what Nick just kind of walked us through is that it starts with different laws that they're trying to overturn. And so it's in different tracks. But what I think is fascinating is reading the opinions and seeing how they take the ideas and Kennedy kind of, you know, again, says like this idea of marriage uh, that you choose who you love that that is your choice and your freedom to do so. That is kind of the value through line in both of these that I found collectively interesting when we look at these two. You know, two other questions before we wrap up, um, but guys, any any other questions, please feel free to put them in the, um, in the Q&A, I mean, in the chat and I'll look for them. Number one, um, so the 14th Amendment was used to both distinguish between state action and private citizen action, as well as applying rights to all citizens across state borders. So does it fully apply to all state action and all private citizens action? How is that measured out? And then it applies over borders, correct? That's a, uh, that's what do you mean like over, over borders? You mean like state borders? State borders, yeah. And that's the, kind of the hard part around this is that you, know, you, you should be able to move from state to state and have the same fundamental freedoms. Yes, but that means yes. you don't have the same exact freedoms just to parse that out. Yes, well, because the thing is states can still discriminate in some ways between out-of-state citizens and in-state citizens. I mean, that's can be a question of like uh, taxations or fees or licensing and yeah, all sorts of things in which states can still uh, discriminate in some respects, it's just, the idea is that there's certain fundamental rights or liberties that they cannot abridge. Exactly. So that, you have to make, yes, you have, that's why it's a hard question. You have to parse that part. Yeah. Um, so, so that, that is difficult. We, I mean, keep in mind, as I said, right, the slaughterhouse has not been overturned. So mm -hmm. privileges or immunities itself has, is, which in, under the original text was supposed to do kind of this work of the, and that's part of why it's a hard question is because now due process and equal protection is actually doing the work that textually maybe the privileges or immunities clause was supposed to do. Hmm. Um, so that's why we still have these, these 12 questions, what's a, what's a fundamental right? Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that when we get to Obergefell versus Loving, this is a five to four decision, right? So part of the reason that I say that it's Obergefell is a little more, there's, it's more contentious is I do think there's kind of a separate set of histories and um, disputes in terms of uh, race versus um, kind of traditional marriage. And uh, so you have four dissenters, right? Some very strong mm -hmm. dissents in this case that has to do, I think, still with the notion of what states versus federal government are supposed to be able to do, right? And so that, in other words, I think that issue is not gone. Yep. And I think it's important to recognize that too, right? So um, yeah, it's not just clean and done after afterwards, which would be good right. when we're talking about things like Dred Scott.